That was learning to fly. Has uh, a new Pink Floyd arised from the ashes to prove they could do it again? Um, no, I don't think so really. I don't think we ever felt that we'd gone to ashes. Uh, there was a long period with us not working and being unclear about when we would work again, but I think certainly David and myself felt that this was a period of non-work where there were differences within the band and so on and that the intention always was that at some point we could continue. Did you, the people around you believe that you could actually have a success again? Um, I think the people around us did. Uh, <laughs> particularly, I, I think, particularly once we started work and had something tangible to, to show, um, people began to gain in confidence. It, inevitably, it's... Uh, a little alarming when you start work with a complete sort of blank page and with a history behind you and losing a, a very important member. Um, it, you know, you don't know how it's going to work out. I mean, even, even if you produce something great, the public just might have moved on to something else. You know, there's nothing guaranteed ever. Did you ever feel the pressure because of all, all the things you've done before? Um, not badly, I think. Um, there always is a sort of pressure, but to some extent uh, we've also learned that the only way to work is to sort of get on with what you want to do now. If you try and sort of think too hard about what you've done before and whether uh, you should be looking at what you've done to continue something, um, it's, it's not very helpful to, to doing anything, to, to working. It, it tends to confuse the issue. All you can do is just follow on along the track. And you fly high. On, on this tour, uh, it's said that it's even more spectacular than the ones uh, you've done before. Uh, you've been pioneers when it comes to mixed media shows. You've been using slides and lights. What is the philosophy behind uh, making a mixed media show? Uh, the philosophy, really, I guess, was that uh, we never thought that we were that good at uh, projecting as uh, human beings. And, you know, as, as, as intimate artists, our music never lent itself to real small clubs and intimacy really and as it's as it and we have grown it's get got less to do with that and um, particularly now when we're doing these vast things that's the type of thing that works the best it uh, reduces us personally to things of, of a lesser importance but uh, the overall show and the music becomes more important have you ever missed the uh, playing in small clubs I still play in small clubs. I played in one in Copenhagen the other night. <laughs> <laughs> was it good to yeah, do something great. different yeah. from being We do that stage. quite often. I mean, I, uh, I have a solo career, and we have, which means I can go out and play in places three, four thousand seaters up to eight thousand seaters, that sort of thing. Um, on this tour, we're doing club things for fun with uh, the, the, the younger musicians. Um, so. I think uh, it's probably best to keep Pink Floyd in the sort of thing it's good at. To what extent do you feel that you have been part of the development on stage effects? Um, well, we have broadened that a certain extent, but more than that we've just discovered little things and tied them together with other things in ways that people haven't done them before. And we don't actually really invent very many things, you know, it's just uh, the application of the technology that's available to you. And so it's a matter of finding things and, um, and using them in a way that other people haven't used them. Uh, this show particularly has pushed forward all sorts of areas. of. of it's, we've certainly continued with ideas. I mean, we've quite often taken an old idea and just kept working it, and, and, and hopefully improved it. Sid Barrett mm -hmm. who left the group in 1968. How difficult was it for you to replace Sid? It was fairly difficult at first. Um, it took me a while to find my way. But um, I can't remember such a long time ago. I'm still the new boy now. I've been in here 20 years. <laughs> uh, you, you started using uh, sounds from everyday life, like footsteps, a child crying, in a much wider extent than it had been done before. Uh, why did you, what was the idea behind it? Um, well, uh, 
I think, it, again, it was a way of trying to tell stories in music. Generally, when those effects have been used on records, they've, they've tended to have been an attempt to create a, a sound picture, sometimes an amusing one, sometimes for amusement, sometimes sort of more seriously. In fact, of course, musicians, uh, particularly in sort of modern composing, have been working with sounds uh, an enormous amount, and our use of it is minimal compared to um, Stockhausen or a whole bunch of, of, sort of modern um, classes, so-called classical composers. Uh, I just think it's a, an area that you get an idea, you do some work with it, and then you think, ah, oh, next time it'd be nice to do it another way. It's, it's, there are some things that you have a go at and then you drop. I mean, for instance, we did one album, um, Atom Heart Mother, with an orchestra. And that was interesting, but it wasn't something where we said, that was great, we must do the next one like that. Using a choir and a brass band and uh, Pink Floyd, uh, it's quite a chance you took there to release a record like that. Well, I don't think you ever feel that you're taking a chance. You just, as I say, you just press on with what you want to do next. And uh, generally, you think you're pretty clever. You, know, you just think, yeah, we'll do yeah. that, and it'll, it'll be interesting. And you get it. If you get excited about it, it's not a problem. And if you don't get excited about it, you shouldn't be doing it anyway. So it all seemed like a very good idea at the time. Um, it, it's not, you know, it wasn't a risk at all. But as I said, it was something that was, was interesting, and particularly the choir, I think. Uh, some of that I still like very much. But we recorded it in a very old-fashioned way. Um, Roger and I went out and did the backing track more or less in one take, so 20 minutes long, which now would be absurd. You know, there's a million better ways of doing it. And you can still, because of the way it was done, it doesn't sound as good as it could. Atom Heart Mother showed the way forward quite well, but it wasn't very good. And metal is the one which uh, clearly showed where we were going and that it was good as well. And um, it, yeah, for me, it's the first of the albums that I really like. The ones before, I don't care for very much. You must have had some laughs with that dog. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, but that, no, that was, I mean, an extraordinary sort of thing for, in a way for Pink Floyd because it took no time at all to do. It was just chance. Someone came into the studio with the dog. The dog was sort of sensitive to a harmonica, I think, and, and suddenly started howling. And it's not unique. And we've then found, I think when we were doing the Pompeii film, it was another dog. And there's a track with my own song, which is the same track, more or less, but with a different dog. When you look back on the Pompeii film, uh, what do you think about it? The fact that it was, a lot of it is played live in the open air with a wind blowing gives it a real sort of grit that we're actually trying, we're working. Uh, you know, the worst thing of, uh, that dates a film is a band simply miming away. You know, we were actually there doing it. So it has a, a, a feeling of reality to the play, which is, is nice. There isn't really a true pattern. I, I don't think one can distinguish a pattern, but you can see a sort of rhythm in, in terms of metal being this, an interest in these sort of long drawn out pieces that move through different, different sort of, it's almost a romantic musical experience, you know, wafts from one field to another and returns back to a, a sort of opening piece and so on. Um, and then, then Dark Side of the Moon is, is a sort of a reaction against that, and it's much more compact and moves much faster. It's paced in a diff completely different way. And Did you ever dream of the, what would happen to Dark Side of the Moon being on the charts for 14 years? No, I never dreamt about it. And it's interesting because I, I think it's a good album, and I think it's lasted well. I mean, I'm proud of it. But it's. Um, I think we've been very, very lucky. I think it's important, perhaps, for us to be aware how lucky we've been that the album has been there, but not sort of always above all the other albums we've made, because I think it could have been a terrible millstone around our necks, that it could be that sort of the record that nothing ever matches up to. And we were, I mean, lucky, or certainly The Wall sold more copies, um, other albums have sort of done different things in the meanwhile. We've been very lucky not to be stuck with that always as the reference. Was uh, Dark Side of the Moon a more uh, socially conscious album than the ones before? Yeah, it was the, uh, it was the first one where 
uh, it had a, a, a consistent theme all the way through it, through the whole album that was that was that was socially conscious and was actually meant to say something um, cohesive, linear all the way through it. So money, it has been used on TV, on yeah. radio. Whenever people mention money, uh, they they play the song money. Do you feel that? Well, that's because of the cash register loop more than anything else. And that's, <laughs> that's I mean that's a very it's a very easy symbol to, for people to use, to borrow, to, to show on their programs. And they all know it's sold quite a few copies and most people have heard it, so... Do you feel it's been abused? No, no, not at all. I mean, I think um, people have rather simplistic... I mean, <laughs> sometimes television is rather unimaginative. Um, uh, it's... No, I don't think it's abused. I mean, it can be a problem if you take a piece of music and just identify it too strongly with something. Um, I mean, that's always a problem with rock videos, full stop. The business of whether the thing is, is better left in abstraction uh, or whether if you give it an image, it, it destroys all the thought processes that people can work with the rest of the time. Um, I think it's important not to take it too seriously. I mean, it still is it's only rock and roll. It, it's very nice if an important point can be made through the lyrics or through music generally. I mean, that's, it can be used as a very powerful tool, th occasionally by some of the best songwriters, or occasionally by an event like Band Aid or something like that, Live Aid. Um, but in terms of sort of how the music is used on television or whatever, I think it's, it's not, not something that bothers me particularly. Isn't rock and roll serious? No, I don't think it is, really. It's, um, it ha as, as I said, it has serious moments, but the mainstream of rock and roll is ephemeral. It's here today, gone tomorrow. It's, uh, it's, some, it's the diary. You know, it's, it's why it's so important to people in some ways, because it just marks a moment in their life you know, at some point. And it, um, Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. About, I, know, I think it, um, it's a serious business and it should be done as well as possible. But I think it's very dangerous to get too sort of serious about it and treat it as high art. I think there are flashes of brilliance in, in rock and roll, you know, particular performers, particular performances. But to try and weigh it down with a sort of art uh, blanket is, um, is dangerous. I mean, rock music should be taken as seriously as the person who writes the song wants it to be taken and as seriously as the people who listen to the song want to take it. Um, it's a wonderful thing about it is that there are no rules and to, to say that uh, you shouldn't take it seriously is about as stupid as saying you've got to take all of it seriously. How tough was it to release an album after Dark Side of the Moon? It was tough, um, but it was, that was a difficult period. But. I think we all re eventually realised that we did like making music, that we did want to do it again. But Wish You Were Here is much more romantic than Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> and one of the songs is Shine On Your Crazy yeah. Diamond, yeah. and it's dedicated to Sid Barrett, mm. an original member of Pink Floyd. You reach for the secret to after which you here came animals. And on, on the cover there's a photo of uh, a pig flying over Battersea Power Station. And uh, I've heard that the pig got out of hand while you were taking photos. Yes, this is true. This is quite true. The pig did escape. He was... Uh, we tried to film on the... I think it was a Friday. We tried to film on the afternoon and the sky wasn't right and so on. And we'd actually been told that we had to have a sharpshooter there to shoot him down because it was in the London controlled area for Heathrow Airport. Um, and unfortunately on the next morning the sharpshooter was late and the pig escaped um, and went flying off chased by a police helicopter. Um, but was eventually recovered somewhere and I, there's a story that he gave some airline pilot the fright of their lives coming through the clouds but I have to say I think it's probably not true. <laughs> It seemed to be more and more uh, Roger Water 
projects, like uh, The Wall, he wrote yeah. 23 out of 26 yeah. songs. Yeah. Were you more or less studio musicians for his ideas at that time? No, no, no. Um, this is a common myth, which is completely untrue. I mean, when you write a song, I mean, the, the, the delineation between writing a song and, and turning that song into a record is a very, very, you know, the, the point where writing ends and production starts and where writing ends and, and musician playing starts is a very, very blurred one, um, which no one has ever really satisfactorily worked out. And uh, in, in publishing terms, uh, they have it that, uh, you know, the guy who wrote the, the chords and the, the, the words is the guy who wrote the song. And, and it's a very blurred thing, but uh, the wall would not have been anything remotely like it is if um, we hadn't been working with us. Your guitar sound is uh, very much like the sound picture in, in Pink Floyd, a very, personal way. Well <laughs> very personal way of, of playing. Yeah. Uh, did you ever feel uh, underestimated in, in Pink Floyd? Um, no, not really. I never sort of got that impression. Do you think I was? No, I was thinking compared to Roger Waters. Well, Roger has always been a much better self-publicist than I am. One sentence, okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a, you know, there's a lot of things in a group, in, a, in, a, in, a, in any sort of situation that involves several people working towards a common goal. Uh, and there are a lot of things that are very hard to understand, even by the people who are involved with it, and are invisible and hard to understand for people who are not involved with it on the outside of it. They don't, don't see how things get done. Um, and, you know, even myself, I have, um, you know, been slow to understand some of the things that go on and what makes something into what it becomes. And they've, everyone said it about, you know, things like the Beatles and, and, and us and other people that the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, you know. And if you take it apart and dissect and look at each individual thing, you can't understand quite why it would become what it becomes when it's all put together. Um, and that's something no one will ever really fully understand. You know. Certainly something Roger doesn't understand. <laughs> the initial idea for the final cut was to use up some of the material that we'd got um, left over from the wall. That's why it was called the final cut. It wasn't anything to do with the band finishing. It was the idea of using up all the material for the wall that hadn't managed to make it onto the record. And there were some nice bits and pieces. Then we started work and it became sort of more and more evident that we weren't having much fun doing it and that the material we were using was wrong. So there was a lot of rewriting and adding of extra songs and it was very, it was a real sort of hodgepodge of, of stuff. Um, and you know, working isn't always great fun. I mean, it's not just a sort of hobby where you have to, sometimes you just persevere with doing things that you're not particularly enjoying. Um, because it, you know, it's your job as well as everything else. It's what you do. And sometimes you don't know when you're having an argument or a, a, a feeling bad about something, whether it's a necessary part of the work process. And that after you've been through that, it, you come to, uh, you know, an easier area. Unfortunately, we didn't. <laughs> and then, after four years of silence, again, you came up with a momentary lapse of reason. And yeah, it wasn't you? entirely silence. I mean, I think both David and I yeah, and Roger had all been albums, working yeah. and doing things of one sort or another. But Pink Floyd was silent. Yeah, sure. And then, a momentary lapse of reason. Uh, it has been a success. And are you satisfied? Yeah. Mm. I'm very... I'm satisfied because it's... Um, I think it's, a, I'm proud of the album, I think it's got some very good songs on it, probably a higher proportion of good songs than a lot of the previous album uh, that stand there in their own right rather than sort of fill in between other songs. Um, I think it's uh, better played than anything we've done before and I think it's a very good base for carrying on. I don't think it's the definitive album and that, you know, great, we've done it, we've cracked it, you know, we've shown we're still there, let's all retire for another seven years. It's a nice base to work and do something else from, just as this show is, you know, yes, we've got all sorts of new bits and pieces sort of going for it and learnt a lot about computer.
computer technology, laser technology, all the rest of it. It's the stepping stone for the next, the next project. What motivates you to keep on working? I like it. I like making music. I like playing on stages. It's a wonderful thing. It's better than having a job. Have you ever tried that? Yeah. I've had lots of jobs in my time. This is definitely the best one. Looking back is, uh, to, be is a, to be treated lightly. I mean, it's nostalgia, it's fun to do occasionally, but I think it's uh, extremely, um, I don't know, dangerous, but I think it's, uh, a, um, it's a dead end for a band. You know, one of the things that I've always said, whether I'll stick to it or not, I don't know, is that I would hate to go out as a nostalgia band playing the songs we were playing 15 years ago for an audience who were with us 15 years ago. You know, it's, you've got to feel if, that you're going out and, and breaking new ground. I mean, that you're reaching new audiences, that people are interested in what you're doing now, not in revisiting their childhood.